when we think about the podcast, we're talking to folks who are investors and folks who are operators and, and folks who are both. And Gary is on the Mount Rushmore of both. He was a founder that went went through the, the highs and the lows and an exit. He, he raised a $3 billion AUM across multiple funds. He is the CEO of Y Combinator, where basically you, you are a, a factory and an institution to go from zero to one. And so Gary has maybe more firsthand knowledge of the early stage journey that founders go through and early stage investors go through than maybe anybody. Yeah, we think about what makes a good guest. There's a couple factors. One is, uh, are they like approachable and easy to talk to, conversational? Gary's a 10 out of 10 there. And then two is, do they have some strong opinions? And then three is, do they actually have advice and practical learnings that our listeners can take away? And so the hope is that Gary checks all those boxes and we we think you'll love the conversation funny enough we're lucky to be in gary's house in san francisco he's a very kind guy to invite us into his home and it was a great conversation and hope you guys all enjoy it we're just gonna jump into it um we did want to start by going back for folks who don't know your career and how how you got here so we want to go all the way back to palantir employee number 10 at palantir tell us a little bit about what that experience was like absolutely um I guess I almost have to start a little bit earlier in that um, I grew up in the Bay. So just being in the sort of shadow of tech meant that um, I was just really excited that technology could go out and, you know, computer technology and then suddenly the internet was something that uh, I knew that literally the engineers and the people who were building it, they were, you know, our neighbors Mm -hmm. and it was just all happening in Cupertino or I grew up in Fremont. So it was like, you know, it was happening in our backyard that uh, technology that could touch a billion people and would like remake society was being made in our backyard. And so um, being able to go to Stanford, study computer engineering, that was a real blessing to me. I actually didn't expect to even be able to get in hmm. at the time, uh, weirdly, because I thought, you know, a Chinese American kid growing up in the Bay Area wanting to study computer science, like that's not really that diverse, honestly. (laughs) I thought I had no shot, Uh, but I felt pretty lucky to get into Stanford. And then friends of mine um, were in my fraternity at Stanford, and uh, it was Joe Lonsdale and Stephen Cohen, two of the co-founders of Palantir. So I had gone up to Microsoft for a couple of years to work as an engineer, and um, they said, Gary, we're starting a company. Could you come and join us? And uh, the person who was bankrolling it and sort of starting it with them was Peter Thiel, who had, uh, you know, today he's sort of this, uh, you know, I mean, to me even, he is like this incredible person who's brought together capital and puts companies together. But uh, what's funny that's like sort of lost to the sands of time in some ways is that, you know, he himself was an entrepreneur Mm -hmm. and is an entrepreneur. He had just sold PayPal you know, today he's sort of, you know, billionaire, you know, loved and hated. But back then he was, you know, a, a very successful Stanford alum founder. And um, he was putting his own money to start this company. And my friends uh, told me, hey, you should come join us. And I said, guys, I have health insurance <laughs> and uh, I have a job. <laughs> like, you know, I might this get is promoted. Microsoft, right? You're at Microsoft. Yeah, this okay. is Microsoft in 2003. Um, I'd been building web technology for years. And uh, I guess as an example of one of the things that um, I stopped believing in and I shouldn't have, I actually thought that the web was dead mm. in 2003. Uh, web 1.0 had, you know, bo- boomed and busted. Uh, I actually really wanted to work at a startup coming out of college in 2003, but there were none really. Yeah. Um, it was a very different time. Like our that whole generation of really good engineers ended up going to work at Microsoft and some of the bigger companies back then. And um, yeah, Peter Thiel and uh, Joe and Stefan took me out to dinner and they flew me back from Seattle to have dinner with uh, Peter at, I think he had a new French restaurant called Frison. It was a bad restaurant, actually. <laughs> it was not that good. I think um, the the funny thing, though, is uh, you know Peter was so certain that um, the power of engineers and product people was just so intense that he said, 
Gary, I'm so sure this is the right thing. Why don't I write a personal check for you? Like how much a year do you make at uh, Microsoft? Mm -hmm. And I told him it was, I think, $72,000. And, uh, you know, he wrote the check and said, like, you can cash this right now, quit your job. Mm -hmm. And I should have waited until after the end of the dinner to say no, because we were kind of staring into our soup after that. <laughs> um, and uh, I went back to Microsoft and, you know, I did get promoted from level 59 to level 60 as a program manager. <laughs> but, uh, you know, my friends just started working on code and, uh, you know, working on demos, trying to sell the V1 of Palantir. And uh, about a year later, they got uh, one of our mutual, really close friends, Bob McGrew, to quit his PhD at, in computer science. Mm. And I said, oh, I made a horrible mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and they had already started hiring some of the smartest people we all mutually knew. And uh, I came down for, I think, a wedding for one of our friends. And they, you know, I toured the office and they said, you, you know, you should quit now. Like, we're going to start the uh, finance, the financial analysis side of Palantir and you could run it. Um, and I said, you know what? I, you know, I guess sometimes opportunity does knock twice. And I quit my job the next day. And uh, moved back to the Bay Area. So, Gary, was that first meeting with Peter and the check, was that a co-founder opportunity? Yeah. And okay. I said uh, no to that. Yeah. And, you know, in, in retrospect, like, I think they offered me like 1% of the company. Yeah. And uh, in retrospect, I probably could have gotten maybe five times as much. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I have a video on YouTube that was my first viral video, my $200 million mistake. Uh, I think if we update it to current public valuation, maybe it's $400 million. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, if, if we include the idea that I could have co-founded it, that probably would have been, you know, easily multi-billion dollar mistake. Absolutely. Yeah. So you're at Palantir. How long did you spend there? How many years? Oh, two years okay. only. So I, um, I have this thing in me, which is, uh, which I've learned over time where that's from, but, uh, I'm prone to rage quitting <laughs> in the past. <laughs> so you <laughs> rage was, quit <laughs> when I was younger. Uh, you know, Joe Lonsdale is a friend of course, yeah. uh, but you know, sometimes hard to work for. Yeah. Yeah. Founders are like that. Yeah. And did right. you know you wanted to become a founder and decided like, what's the, what's the story of how you leave to go start your own thing? Cause after that was posterous, right? Uh, yeah, that's okay. right. Um, actually in between, so I rage quit Palantir, uh, which was very interesting because Palantir is mm -hmm. itself a very strong, uh, religion. It's, I mean, of a sort, you know, it's, uh, we believe X, nobody else believes that yeah. yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's the Peter Till quote of cults make the best startups, which right? Is, I totally see it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if anything, what we try to do now at Y Combinator is try to teach that next generation that these are sort of the ways to take capital and turn it into great value. It mm -hmm. actually passes through giving people an incredible amount of meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, so the most interesting thing about leaving something that has such a strong culture is becoming an apostate. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Now you're an enemy. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Um, which was painful. But on the other hand, like, I, even then, I really had a, a clear idea that, you know what, like, I probably shouldn't be going back and hanging out with my friends at uh, Palantir that much. Like, uh, it's important for them to close rank and then, like, be able to march forward with the mission. And I'm glad they did it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, I'm also very glad for the concept of equity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. So how did you know you wanted to be a founder? You start out of Microsoft level 60, then you hit, take an early stage bet at Palantir, but then you take the ultimate bet of I'm going to be a founder and got into YC. Was it YC that got you over the edge or like, how did you make that leap? Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine uh, named Chinagawal, we're another, another fraternity brother of mine from Stanford, actually. Um, we actually just were hanging out and he was already working on uh, this little piece of code that he used with his uh, personal blog. So you could uh, take any photo and just email it and uh, it would, you know, parse the email and turn it into a beautiful photo gallery. And it worked, I think, with WordPress. It was like this mm -hmm. Java app that ran on a server. And um, I built the Rails piece of that. So instead of posting to a WordPress, it would post to our own uh, blog platform called, and we called it Posterous. It was mm -hmm. like, you know, preposterous without the pre. Um, and it was really a sort of weekend project, actually. Um, we didn't know if it could be a business. Uh, it even sort of seemed like a potentially bad idea to try to start, uh, you know, social software 
in uh, 2008, but in retrospect, it was actually a really good time because the iPhone was brand new. Uh, the App Store had not had any really great mm -hmm. apps for f posting photos from iPhones yet, and that was actually really uh, the reason why we could grow very quickly. And uh, when I think about that time, I, I just think it's very fascinating how much it was just, we were builders building things for ourselves, and it was a toy, and we didn't even know if this could be a business or not. And yet, like now with hindsight, we can look back on it and say, if you were gonna create social software that could set the world on fire, uh, you know, that was actually an incredible time. And that was um, why we grew 10X year on year. Uh, we did apply to Y Combinator and get in, and uh, you know, that allowed us to launch on TechCrunch. And I remember Michael Arrington left our launch post on TechCrunch all weekend. Hmm. So we got something like 10, 20,000 users from that. And then uh, 20,000 became, became 40,000, became hundreds of thousands. And uh, we ended up building it into a top 200 website on the internet. Um, it sold it, right? Yeah, and Twitter bought it later. Um, and then the funniest thing is there was a moment when uh, it went sideways for us. And uh, the maxim in Silicon Valley is that you shouldn't worry about competition. And um, I think one of the reasons why Postris didn't become as big as you know, what we wanted uh, was because we maybe took that maxim a little mm. bit too uh, close to heart mm. um, two, in two ways, especially having to do with competitors. One, when we launched, uh, Michael Arrington actually posted saying, Posturus beats Tumblr in simplicity. Mm. And that frame was very interesting because uh, it was Arrington's frame. It was very useful for us, but there are points at which, you know, what, you, what got you here won't get you there. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, the other time that sort of had to do with competitors, that was a real inflection point moment was, uh, when Instagram launched. Mm -hmm. And so lost to the sands of time, Posturus was actually one of the check marks next to Facebook, Foursquare, uh, Twitter. And, uh, and it was us Posturus. I think Tumblr was in there too. And, uh, basically Instagram would be able to post to Posturus mm -hmm. and we were one of the networks that, um, you know, Instagram knew it needed to sort of steal users from. And I remember when we launched, uh, Chris Saka, one of our investors, uh, emailed us saying, hey, what do you guys think of Instagram? And before I could answer, my co-founder replied, it sucks. And I was like, oh no. Uh, and, and then Chris replies, one line answer, like, I'm very disappointed in you guys. And of course you're in the fog of war, like you never think about it again. But now I think about it often because uh, that was the moment when Posture stopped growing. And I think that, that now, as an investor, and we're spending a lot of time with a lot of founders all of the time, um, one of the things that we're supposed to do is actually help people understand where they fit in the landscape. Like uh, Paul Graham always talks about there's a you know periodic table of startups mm -hmm. and we're basically discovering new elements all the time. The best people to discover those next elements are actually the engineers and the builders. And, um, you know, all, the, all along we were thinking that we were trying to win the uh, periodic table of startups with this blogging idea. But the real thing that was more present to hand that we didn't even know about uh, at the time that we should have was that uh, a very dominant photo-based social network that was built on top of uh, the iPhone, that was a one-time thing. And that was like the thing that um, is the durable monopoly that now Meta had to buy. Right? And are you saying, if I'm hearing you right, tell me if I'm wrong, that if you would have cared slightly more about the competitive landscape, you might have come up with this insight and potentially have built a better business than you did. And is that one of the lessons I'm hearing? Or I think am I so. taking that too far? I mean, I think you need to, you have a fog of war. You don't know what's going to happen, but by default you're making, um, like it or not, you're making bets on what the future mm -hmm. is and will be, mm -hmm. uh, and what you want, you know, we focus a lot on, you know, what we want the future to be, but at the same time, uh, being able to predict what that is yeah. is also very important. Like you don't have, we certainly have control over what we believe the future will be, but we don't have control over necessarily what the future actually is. And the more predictive we can be, 
uh, the better our decisions are along the way. So what are the actions you would have taken with the benefit of hindsight? What are the actual things you would have done differently? Um, what's interesting going back to, I think the role of investors today, um, I remember pitching benchmark and meeting Peter Fenton, uh, for the series a, you know, we had our hockey stick graph Mm -hmm. and we had really good retention, uh, but not that great in retrospect. And, uh, he asked us one pointed question. It was, uh, you know, are you a platform or are you a network? So Instagram was a network. Mm -hmm. Squarespace was a platform. Um, and so we had to choose. And uh, instead of saying one or the other, uh, me and my co-founder looked at each other and we said both. And that was the wrong answer. Mm-hmm. Um, either of those paths, we could have uh, tried to own the social network for you know photos and you know visual storytelling. Um, or we could have charged money and been like WordPress or Squarespace and become really a great business. Mm -hmm. And um, we didn't choose either. And that was a mistake. So the lesson might be, be be deliberate about what path you're taking, would you say? And saying no to something is saying yes to something else and a lot of those learnings. And what's funny is uh, embedded in that story is actually one of the biggest and most difficult questions that every startup faces now, uh, especially in a time of high interest rates which is, do we try to be profitable or do we try to raise the next round? Yep, yep. What do you think about that, by the way? Let's, let's ask that question right now, and then we'll get into some more here. But profitability versus building to raise the next round, especially in this environment, yeah. what's your thoughts there? I guess what's funny is it's, uh, it doesn't matter. Like, it's actually what the founders need to look at it and say, well, I have a choice. So, and I think the dominant narrative, the dominant thing that people make a mistake around is that they say both, which is what we did. We said, well, we're kind of like a platform, but we're afraid to charge because if we charge money, that'll mess with our growth rate. And then on the flip side, um, you know, if we, if we become this network, um, you know, how, how sh- we should probably be spending all of our time Uh, instead on network features, instead of like customization and custom domains and things like that. So because we chose something in between, we sort of did both poorly. And then we allowed our competitors to basically win in their respective spaces. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's sort of recurring here. Um, A lot of founders I meet, you know, if you have a burn rate and you're not profitable, then, uh, you're trying to work backwards from your next round. But right now that next round is really, really like, unless you're literally in AI and LLMs and computer vision or like in a super hot space, um, you don't know if that next round is actually coming. And, uh, I think across the board from the past sort of few years, what we're seeing is founders have to make a choice. Do you know, do you want to, can you get to profitability or cash flow break even and then positive? And then can you grow out of cash flow? And then that increasingly, you know, depending on what happens with uh, certainly relationships with China and um, you know, inflationary versus deflationary effects at the macro level, we actually don't know. <laughs> and uh, the safest thing is try to get profitable. Yeah, makes sense. So if we're continuing along the journey, you, you are a founder and next is you start getting into investing, right? Your partner at, at YC at that point, what was the transition like from being in that fog of war startup founder mode to being a, a partner at YC? Um, honestly, I was super burnt out. Um, you know, and I think some of it I had to realize over time, um, was my own doing, um, my co-founder and I were friends now, but we actually stopped talking mm. to each other for something like eight, 10 years, mm. which is pretty crazy. But, uh, that's like part for the course mm-hmm. for, uh, co-founding relationships. It's like, you know, uh, definitely like a, a marriage. <laughs> you just like lashed to the hip. And, um, I think that was really, really painful. Basically, uh, it was 2010. We were coming off of, you know, two and a half, two years straight of like nonstop growth and then growth completely flatlined uh, for lots of reasons. Some of it was Instagram, some of it was 
Uh, you know, I didn't hire enough engineers, so we had incredible technical debt by then. Um, and then the tricky thing was the really uh, how good the startup was going actually covered up a lot of uh, flaws in my relationship with my co-founder. Mm. Um, I guess one of the recurring themes that I'm realizing is, you know, if you take the startup maxims and just apply them blindly, like they will come and bite you in the butt later. <laughs> you know, one of them was, hey, you should have a really good relationship with your co-founder. And I think my interpretation of it in 2009, 2010 was that, oh, I should be collaborative. I should, you know, if they say we should do X and I think we should do Y, uh, you know, maybe I'll water down Y a little bit, like by 50%, and then we'll like yeah, compromise. compromise. Uh, which sounds very reasonable. And in a marriage, that's like what you need to do. Like, but in a co-founding relationship, um, you're far better off actually just having the fight. Tyler and I talk about this a lot and we say the, the best partnerships are the people that you enjoy disagreeing with the most. You enjoy arguing with the most and you know get, the relationship won't yeah. be harmed and it gets heated and, and, and there That's are right. emotions and certainly, but you have to enjoy that going through that process with that person. Cause you're going to do it again and again and again. That's totally right. So yeah, I, I had a totally wrong misconception mm -hmm. of how a co-founding relationship, relationship should yeah. be. Uh, and now I recognize how toxic that is. Um, I ended up having a bit of a um, like psychosomatic response at some point mm -hmm. where I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat, um, you know, I randomly like break out in fever. And now when I look at it, um, you know, I have a very overdeveloped prefrontal cortex. I can like, <laughs> I can tell myself a narrative and like force it to happen until uh, my body revolted actually. Mm. Um, and so, Luckily, I mean, Harge Tagger, who I work with at YC now, uh, was one of the first outside partners at YC. Uh, he and Jessica Livingston and Paul Graham at YC were looking for a designer in residence. And uh, I was burning out. And So you weren't even investing to start. You were a designer in residence. That's exactly. Right? Okay. Yeah. So for the first six months, uh, honestly, I was licking my chops because I was like, <sighs> oh, I, you know, my startup is not going well. Uh, you know, I had to resigned just even like partially for health issues. I just like couldn't go to work mm -hmm. anymore. Um, and then I thought, actually that was a very interesting time because the other things I could have done, I think uh, Brian Chesky and Joe Gebbia asked me to come and run special projects for Airbnb, Airbnb. At tw in tw early 2011. So that would have been fascinating. Mm -hmm. I think they just hit a billion dollars valuation then. Um, hard to believe, but you know, 100X from there, yeah. unbelievable, like hats off to that team. Um, Ben Silberman of Pinterest, Pinterest, I think they were about 10 people at mm -hmm. the time. And they said, Hey, you should come head our design team. Uh, and so it was that, or, you know, YC just felt like home to me and I loved working with founders that early. So, uh, I, you know, I think I got paid 20 or $30,000 a year to just come and <laughs> it was supposed to be like at, you know, 15, 20 hour a week contract just for me to like you know, recuperate from yeah. my startup. And uh, instead, it just sort of consumed me in a different way. Um, just because being that close to the metal with so many founders, you know, it just really lit, lit me up in a way that like, um, even those other jobs might not have, honestly, like I uh, learned a lot. And then that was also a very special time in YC's history because today people look back and say, oh, YC was inevitable. Mm. It's an institution. Like it is early stage startups personified. Like, you know, it's the most concentrated form of, YC, of, uh, of Silicon Valley. But uh, at the time it was still yeah. like sort of this fringe thing. Like engineers knew about it. Yeah. But um, it wasn't something that uh, the world knew about. Yeah. All right, so we got. I, I want to get into some practical advice you have for founders, but let's round out the story real quick. So, we got to cover initialized, and then we have to cover coming back to YC in the next five or ten minutes. <laughs> no or worries, so. yeah. <laughs> um, so you go and like start a fund, a, ma a firm, not just a fund, with your your co-founder, you know, and it's a big firm, a big fund, and then you leave to come to YC. We we want to know about initialized, and then we want to know about the decision to leave and how hard it was, how easy it was, you know, as many details as you want to share, and we'll have some follow ups there. But talk about that. So you, you start you start a firm with your friend, and then you leave it. What's the story there? Yeah. Um, let's see. 
So fast forward a little bit, I spent about, uh, I mean, I basically learned how to invest by just being in the loop on Y Combinator. Yeah. So we would read uh, thousands, you know, I, I think the most number of applications I ever read in an application cycle was about a thousand, <laughs> uh, which is wild because I don't think that there's another place in the world where you end up seeing um, that many different types of people and that many different types of ideas. Getting those reps in is incredible. Yeah. yeah. And I really look in that and say, that really helped me so much. I mean, I, if I worked at a VC firm, I think um, in 2010 or 2011, I got an offer to be an EIR at one of our VC firms. And uh, Good I job went to saying no to that one. Well, I mean, it, it sounded like pretty fine. cool. Yeah. And then uh, actually, I think I was working at YC at the time. And Jessica was like, what? You want to be an EIR? That's so lame. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah. I mean, I didn't really understand it at the time. But obviously, with like many years since then, like um, I think there's something incredibly special about uh, being able to see just an open web form mm -hmm. um, to see how VC broadly is done outside of YC. It's actually it's kind of hard to do it. Yeah. I mean. Like who gets to raise money? It's uh, you know certain people who went to certain schools who worked at certain places. Like uh, I sort of get why that is. I mean, we have a finite number of people who we could trust. Yeah. We have very very we we're like you know a speck of dust in this world. Like we just like here and then we're gone. And it's for any individual or even set of individuals to um, see the breadth of what is possible, you just never do it as a VC. Like yeah. even, even leaving YC and then becoming a VC, uh, it was like sort of amazing how different it was. Mm -hmm. Like how many deals could you really, you know, investigate and prosecute in a given year? Like dozens. Hmm. And you, you can't see like the full breadth. And um, the really cool thing about YC was that it was always totally generalist. Yeah. And it really taught me that um, really looking at the best possible founders, like there's a way that they look at problems. There's a way that they, uh, have certain values around how they approach people, how they approach ideas, how they overcome struggle or solve problems. Uh, that's the part that is actually extremely high leverage. And I think, uh, YC has been able to create a process for that, that, um, I, yeah, I just, I have never seen it replicated Makes and I'm not sense. sure if it will be. Yeah. It seems like, uh, there's no one else that can really have the breadth of startups in a generalist way. And like you said, a thousand applications that you're seeing in every cycle. So why did you leave that to go start your own firm? Well, uh, Sam Altman took over yeah. and, um, you know, I, at some point I said, you know what, like YC is, uh, the institution. And then, um, you know, I guess for parallelism stake, I could say it was a rage quit, I but was it was more like rage quitting. <laughs> we're waiting for it. Yeah. yeah, it could have been a rage quit, but uh, what's what's lucky is I by then I um, had really good therapy, and I had, <laughs> <laughs> and I had really good exec coaching, and then um, honestly, there were just so many things I didn't know as a founder or as an early engineer, product manager that I wish I knew, and. Um, it wasn't out there. It was actually inside me, like all these things about my cultural heritage mm -hmm. as a Chinese American child of immigrants, um, all these things about, you know, I was, the, I'm the uh, adult child of alcoholics, which, you know, if your parents were alcoholic, like that's something that a lot of people sort of hide and, um, don't want to talk about. It's unpleasant. But, um, you know, one of the things I encourage everyone watching right now to do is, go online and look up um, adverse childhood uh, experiences, the ACE score. And if you have a really high ACE score, uh, get therapy, seriously. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. not like just purely, that's something that helped me incredibly deeply. And um, it allowed me to be a much better leader. Uh, and all, a lot of the mistakes I made earlier, like they were sort of knee jerk. Like that, that was why in 20, end of 2010, I had to quit my job. Mm -hmm. Like I, or, I mean the startup that I yeah. started, right? Like I could not deal. And, um, it was because I wasn't integrating all of these other things that were happening. And, uh, like if I fast forward to today, uh, I now really understand why, like when we're working with founders all the time, like when you have, um, sort of an un uncontrollable reaction or, you know, you shout at someone or like you react in a certain way in a certain 
setting that you know you're like where did that come from um you can sort of pull pull on that thread and instead of like sort of fighting it like um the path is actually to sort of integrate that so gary um what are the let's let's start with product market fit how do people most effectively go about trying to find it what are the things that they're doing that you notice are sort of pre predeterminant of success. Yeah, you're meeting with people before they find it often. And what have you noticed that the ones who find it, what do they do? Feels like there's sort of two different types. Like some, you know, sometimes people come in with um, incredibly special talents or um, some sort of special insight, and they're just right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, I think of Brian Armstrong with Coinbase yeah. or Apoor Vameta with Parker Instacart. with Rippling. He yeah. just knew it. Yeah. Um, and often those are like the biggest outcomes. Yeah. Uh, and then there, there's this other type that uh, I think sometimes, and this is maybe more common, people approach starting a startup because of the lore, because of the community, because of sort of, uh, mim- you know, mimesis, just mm-hmm. like yeah. mimetic mm-hmm. desire, realizing like, oh, growing up, like I really looked for, looked up to Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. Watch and I the social be like network. That. So they yeah. don't have the insight. Right. They just have the desire to build yeah. a startup. And then that's quite common. And then the only way those people sort of transform from, um, I mean, you're, the bad version of this, it, it sort of looks like you're mailing in a book report. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes like really bad pitches look like that. Mm -hmm. You know, you're taking a pitch and they're walking you through uh, their deck, but it sort of sounds like a book report in college or high school or something like that. Um, It sounds like, you know, it sounds like they're saying the right things. Boring, recited almost. They're reciting it, right? And they're sort of hoping for the B. We call that you're trying to MBA your way into a a startup. Yeah. Into an insight. And I think the hard thing for people to remember is that like there's no, you know, a B is an F mm-hmm. in startups. Pretty like, binary. It's pure, like basically it's either an A plus or an F. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and, and I think that's hard because everything else in society, uh, everything about our upbringing, our school, our, you know, by college, by, you know, the professional world, you know, whether you're coming up through law or business or engineering, there's like, you know, uh, these rungs, like, uh, you know, the society is sort of built as a tournament. Uh, and then the thing to realize is like for startups and finding product market fit, there's no tournament. It's just literally either you found it or not. Mm-hmm. So I'm hearing you right. Tell me if I'm, tell, my, tell me if I'm wrong here. So ideally they've got an insight and that insight was right. Yeah. But the majority may think they have an insight, but they're doing this mimetic thing and trying to be a startup. Talk to those folks. How, do you ever? Do they ever find an insight? Oh yeah, okay. all the time. How do they do it? What, are they, what, do they what, do? what actions are they taking? I guess the best example I can think of is actually Wee Deng at um, Clipboard Health. Okay. So she uh, she you know did YC. She came out and uh, actually lost her technical co-founder immediately. They were doing um, basically Indeed, uh, hmm. you know, resume posting marketplace app for uh, nurses, and. You know, there are many marketplaces. There are many things for nurses. It was pretty undifferentiated for a good number of years. And then the way that she went from um, sort of that to um, actually product market fit was that she started spending a lot more time with a certain segment of people. So she discovered uh, skilled nursing facilities and um, convalescent homes. Uh, funny enough, my mom... Uh, you know, I, growing up, she she was a, a CNA at a convalescent home, and uh, kind of as a latchkey kid, I remember picking up the phone growing up, and uh, you know, it would always be the director of nursing at her work being like, "Hey, can your mom work tonight?" Because we had a cancellation, and so it was like interestingly one of those things that I had heard about, and we had already it was YC company that we had already funded at initialized at the seed, and then when she came in and said well, I started spending time with this particular type of skilled nursing facility Mm -hmm. and discovered um, they were spending a lot of money on one-off consulting. I'm I'm sorry, uh, one-off agencies. So there would be these staffing agencies that would like just, there would be these staffing agencies that literally opened up the book and like started calling people to try to fill these shifts. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically software hadn't touched that yet. And it was because, you know, you can think of all the world of people who are good 
builders, engineers, product people, designers, and then way over here, large parts of the economy that have never seen software, period. Um, and then basically where they touch is like the billion or 10 or $100 billion idea. Mm -hmm. And those are actually uh, out there all the time. And so I think that's what happened. Like we started spending time in these particular types of skilled nursing facilities, realized that there was no software there, built a version of it, and it was very sticky. And now they've built something that's, you know, making nine figures in revenue, like on this incredible trajectory. Uh, and, you know, it, it started as something that like was not that different than a, uh, oh, well, Indeed already does this. I want to do this 10% better. And then she was able to find a place, you know, we call it a thin, thin edge of the wedge. Yeah, where thin you know, edge of the be wedge. Literally like 10x or 100x better. Do you think the insight there is, if you're not sure whether the actual insight is groundbreaking, go find the most desperate customer, which is what you're calling thin edge of the wedge. Is that right? Narrowing, narrowing that focus instead of being, instead of being a... Yeah, a broad. This thing. is very close to our the first episode we had with Andy Ratcliffe talked about find desperation because only when you find that will it spread. That's right. Yeah, it's not it's not a oh that'd be nice or yeah. the hardest thing about everyone says go talk to your users and then by and large um, users are uh, very nice. <laughs> they're you know and they're humans. You're sitting across from a human. Humans like by default nature want to want to help someone and make them you know succeed. And, uh, you know, the trickiest thing is, you know, without feeling something, without like an actual action, everyone's going to say, that sounds like something that they're I do. lying to you right. until they're paying for something or changing a behavior that they would only do out of self-interest. They're lying to you. Exactly. So that feedback is worthless, which yeah. is hard. And we want to be lied to. Yep. As founders, yeah, we love like, it. Yeah. Happy years. Yeah. All right, so lesson one is, all right, find the thin edge of the wedge if you haven't found the insight yet, if you're not there. What else? What else do you notice about founders who go on to find product market fit? How about the, them individually? Are they, are they of a certain demeanor? How do their brains work? How do, they, how do they approach? Are they more intense than other founders? Like what, are they more, I don't know. What do you notice about the founder yeah. themselves? I guess what's funny is um, it's incredible how plain spoken they are. Uh, being... In, very, very, I mean, let's see. Being a truly great communicator helps so much. Um, by being, and the reason why, let's see. I think one thing that's kind of funny, do you guys know, uh, know the meme, the midwit meme? Oh, yeah, so yeah, there's oh, like yeah. 75 IQ, <laughs> yeah. and then there's like the midwit at 100 to 110, and then 150 the IQ, the genius. Yeah. And like it or not, like things that look 75 IQ often are <laughs> yeah, 150 IQ, it. actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a reason for it. The through line is actually that um, really, really great founders are able to communicate in very, very few words these incredibly complex ideas. Yeah. And at the core of a complex idea that's a breakthrough is actually something that is so obvious, actually. And that's the 75 IQ part. So... I think what ends up happening is that when you're pitching and what, you know, the reality is a founder is sort of the prime mover. So they have to go and have that conversation with absolutely everyone all of the time, you know, closing a customer, closing a candidate to work for them, closing money. Um, those are the three sort of fundamental things that a founder has to do. Nobody else really can do that. Everyone sort of thinks that you can hire someone to do those things. Yep. And like well after product market fit, that's possible yeah. when it's like sort of unstoppable. But at the beginning, you're the one who has to explain to people like, no, you should trust me. Like, you know, I know you only have, you know, your 40 hour work week. Like, please spend three hours of that with me on this speculative thing that will get you, a, you know, a 10x result. And you have to be able to say that in, you know, a minute or less. Like when people emphasize the elevator pitch, it's so that that pitch, that core idea, the thing that we believe that nobody else believes, you actually have to breathe that into other people to actually even manifest um, the product, the service, like the company. Um, and so really clear communication. Um, you know, sometimes there are people are saying incredibly 75 IQ things. Um, but at the core of it, like when it really works, it's actually, uh, you know, the 150 IQ thing. Yeah, that's brilliant. So you've got the thin edge of the wedge and you've got the clear communication that 
that touches everything, everything from customers to investors to, to people you're trying to, to recruit. I love that. Um, when you think about once they find it, once they find product market fit, you call it unstoppable. What are, what are mistakes that, that you've seen people make that actually like stop the growth, stop the product market fit? How, how do people screw it up? I mean, I can speak from my own experience. Um, I think the hardest thing for people who view themselves as nice is that um, actually you have you do have to hold people to account, mm. and um, I feel like I always really, really relied on um, design or engineering or like brute forcing it myself. And then I have now come to the realization that um, past the zero to one point, um, you know, the CEO or the leader actually has to hold people to account. And it's almost binary. Like either they, you know, you read about it before, you know, when you're trying to figure out how to be a leader, you read that, um, you know, who, who, who gets fired and who gets hired, who gets promoted, like that's your real culture. Mm -hmm. But you don't really understand it until like, you know, here are two very well-meaning people. One person does it like X and one person does it like Y. And um, who you choose and you have to choose. You can't just be like, it's both. Like the easy way out is, and frankly, like if you look at big tech, that's what big tech is doing. Like it's, let's do both, right? Like we're overflowing on, you know, net revenue it's you know unlimited amount of cash like we don't have to make hard choices anymore mm. like let's do both we'll do it all um and then unfortunately like that's death to culture yeah um because you know sometimes there are like win-win scenarios and you want to find that as much as possible but more often than not like you know everyone's watching like <laughs> you know, which camp do you choose? It's like, you have, you know, in, it's like that, uh, meme everyone, you know, inside everyone, there are two wolves mm -hmm. and which one do you actually feed? Like that's how it works in the organization. Is there a right culture for these startups to succeed? Or is it just important that you have one that is very unique and authentic to the mission that you're on? Or do you see no, like 80% of the time, the culture tends to look fairly similarly yeah. and this is what it is i think the culture um like it or not especially for founders it just radiates out from the founders themselves and you'll find that in like organizations all the time like basically um these days i'm starting to realize basically being ceo is a lot like having power armor <laughs> and you got to be careful great great power comes with with great power comes great responsibility around that so as a re it's just a natural result of the CEO, but are there common things that you've seen with CEOs who have great cultures? Like their, their traits, you know, I'm sure there's some interesting ones. I guess my favorite one these days is um, if you watch Brian Chesky's speeches, which I highly recommend, yeah. I think he did a great one about, you know, design and product management yeah. at the last yeah. Yeah. conference. Yeah. Um, you're sort of seeing like uh, your apex leader at the apex of, um, you know, I mean, if anything, like, I hope it's not the apex. I think they're still just getting started. Mm -hmm. Of all the companies in the world, I think Airbnb is probably hmm. one of uh, the ones that could still 10x, mm -hmm. which is kind of wild. I mean, mainly because you look at the amount of supply in the world. Yeah. It's like, you know, I think a small percentage of space like is available on Airbnb totally. right now. And like, you know, there could be still 100x in that actually, wildly. Um, and if you really examine what Brian's been talking about lately, it's actually that um, the leader, and this is very hard, has to be relatively unapologetic mm. about uh, who they are, what they stand for. And then in order to have a strong culture, you know, they have to actually not pull their punch. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big one. A lot of times you, there's rough edges on these individuals who believe they can light the world on fire. And I think for a long time, when, when things were a little easier in startups, it was about trimming off those rough edges and making you more palatable to a larger group of people. But really what makes them special is, is, the, rough is edges. the rough edges. And then they resonate with a very small group of people, but it's the right people. So you talk about Palantir being a religion and every startup being a cult and things like that. And uh, so I, I think that point about founders needing 
to be authentic that you're talking about. It's a, it's a big deal. Yeah. And it's, it's showing its teeth more now because survival depends on it for these companies. Yeah. And the hard part now, uh, especially now is that, um, I'm starting to realize how different that is than, uh, what it takes to get up into an organization. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's probably one of the most weird paradoxes of venture capital. And it's like large amounts of, especially early stage venture capital, uh, is very resume based. Mm -hmm. And it's like, Oh, if you were, you know, employee number X at this company and you know, you can, your resume says that you like 10 X revenue, like maybe you did, maybe you didn't, but here's, you know, large amounts of very early stage capital for those people. Um, you know, I'm not saying uh, often they're right. Like often these are like the exact right people, but, um, they have to learn to exercise a totally different mm -hmm. way of being. And like being in organizations is totally different than being the founder and CEO. Totally. Gary, one, one part of the YC product that founders seem to really love is these office hours. They sit down with you or with Paul or with their group lead. And it feels like they're able to get answers that they couldn't get without them. So, Founders are listening to this. What are those office hours like? Like, what are the type of things you're teaching founders most commonly? What are the biggest topics you cover, or biggest lessons that you've had to, feels like you repeat most commonly in those office hours that we could give to everyone listening today? Gary's going to say, apply to YC and find out. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's sort of simple. I think, um, let me put it a different way. I, you know, Every, I, there's a Jay-Z line, like everybody want to tell you how to do it. They never, they never did, did it. it. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that that's the trickiest thing. It's like, I kind of get it. Like it's, you know, fun to work with startups and thinking about ideas is super fun. Um, and then what you sort of want is people who uh, have had to do all the hard, terrible mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. and like made the wrong choice. And then uh, largely that's what I try to do in office hours. It's like, what's the 75 IQ thing? Um, <laughs> The funniest thing is, and you see this in startup land all the time, there's sort of like the ritual and then there's the gem. And it's like, ideally in office hours, we're mainly talking about the gems, like what is actually happening and how do we fix it? Yep. Uh, and then the ideal sort of office hours for me is, you know, I don't want to hear like sort of the 20 minute explanation for why something failed. Like that matters in a big company it basically doesn't matter at all inside yep. a startup. Like, you know, startups fail for all sorts of reasons. Uh, one of the things Michael Seibel says at the beginning of the batch that has really resonated for me is, um, you know, do not try to be the median startup at YC. If you're the median startup, you fail. If you uh, are, you know, if you're at the average startup, it's pretty good, but it's because the average yeah. is like all in the table. power law, <laughs> like that, the, you know, the, top end of that like brings up, it like creates all the value. So you have to be a superlative startup. And then most office hours are actually trying to break down what are the 10,000 landmines that kill companies. Um, I think the first one, I mean, I actually did this analysis recently on having funded, you know, sort of hundreds and hundreds of startups. And I made a spreadsheet of awesome. all the startups that I worked with since uh, 2012. And then I think the number one thing was always just not making a thing people actually wanted. <laughs> and it's like in all the lies, like we want to be lied to, yep. we want to feel like, in fact, it's extra hard for the leader because the leader raised this money. The leader hired all these people like in our social situations, yeah. we have to spend all of our time like, hey, let's keep yep. rallying around this thing. You have to have this relentless optimism to even start on the journey and to keep people engaged and involved. But you also have to have this almost cynical view that until until somebody's paying or, or going through pain they're just lying and you're you're just searching for truth and you're super skeptical what, what's that what's that phrase that yeah. uh, when when somebody tells you something you want to hear be skeptical when someone tells you something you don't want to hear you should probably pay attention totally. and it kind of feels like the best founders have that yeah good to great there's a stock you know, Collins book has the yeah the stockdale paradox yeah. and i think about that all the time and if anything i'm always just trying to I'm basically of two modes in office hours. Either people need to believe in their idea more so they can actually get customers and hire and raise money, or they need to be much more 
aware of the thing that's about to kill them. Mm -hmm. How do you think about valuations today? Um, again, it's been, there's, there's certainly been a shift. So what's your advice to folks as they think about raising money, if they have the opportunity to do so, how to think about pricing things? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, th what's funny is if there's, if it were a YC company, I'd say, go talk to your group partner. Um, it, barring that, I mean, fundraising is, uh, almost like a roll of the die these days. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think it was a lot easier in 2021 and it's really, really hard now. Um, and then all you can really do is try to stack, you know, stack the odds in your favor. So, um, you know, have trusted advisors, spend time with them, try to really hone, you know, what do we believe that nobody else believes and then come at it with, uh, evidence really <laughs> like, this is why we know this is great. And then, um, you know, you need to have a hypothesis that is truly huge. Um, yeah. I mean, that was actually one of the more crazy things to realize. Like, again, so many people come over from, from school, from academia, from business and in those realms, like there is a B plus, right? Yeah. Like the B plus will get you someplace. Like it lets you, you know, feed your family, you get promoted, good things happen in startups. Like the B plus is an F and yeah. like you're dead. Like it's as if you never did any of those things. Right. Um, and so that's, that's probably the trickiest thing. So we've probably got five or 10 more minutes and I know you've got a, another meeting, Gary, let's wrap up with a couple thoughts that you may have about the future. One is the future of SF. You're fighting for it, man. You're in the trenches on Twitter X every day fighting for SF as an outsider. If I didn't know anything about you or, or your background, I would say, Oh, this guy's not a YC CEO. He's an SF, you know, fighter. He's a, he's a community leader. Why are you spending so much time on that? Why is that important to the future of YC or you or anything? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the high level here is that I just want more startups to actually succeed. And uh, my experience over and over again is uh, when a company decides not to maximize their ability to be the A plus company, uh, they fail. And so, you know, on the one hand, I really want there to be super vibrant, uh, you know, startup communities everywhere in the world. Um, and then on the flip side, like for the individual founder and founding team, I still think being next to all of the greatest companies and the greatest agglomeration of talent and capital, uh, is the way to maximize the chance to be in like that, you know, top one to 10%. Um, are you talking about Miami or are we talking about, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> We, I mean, we think you're talking I want about them to Utah. Do well. yeah, you... No, I mean, I'd love for every other place to be as successful as possible. Yeah. But um, for that zero to one process, it actually makes a lot of sense to have you know one foot in San Francisco at least. So um, in your mind, this isn't in conflict with YC's mission. You're actually viewing this as a prerequisite to yeah. YC continuing to succeed. Is that, am I hearing you right? Yeah, I mean, I think um, YC, honestly, I think that, you know, we in the community suffered greatly through COVID. Um, it wasn't the same and, uh, it was really, really hard to get people to change how they were doing things, um, from remote over a zoom window. You just can't really do it. Yep. Um, I think, you know, one to a billion, one to billions, like I think, uh, start, you know, move the, move the HQ. Like a lot of things stop mattering when you find product market fit, but I think San Francisco is still the greatest place in the world to find product market fit. I think it's very hard to argue that point. Um, another, another futuristic kind of thing is how, how is the landscape of venture going to shift? Now, you obviously made some decisions about YC continuity when you came in as CEO and, and just walk us through how you think venture is going to change in the coming years. Well, um, I am still really a technological optimist. I think that, um, enabling tech means that, uh, you know, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Um, and then most people sort of believe there's too much money chasing too few good people. And 
uh, too few good ideas. And then as far as I can tell, like none of that's true. Really? Like it's, self, really? it's a self-limiting Tyler and I, Tyler and yeah. I tend to think that we totally. tend to think that fun sizes faults, are too big, fun yes. sizes are too big to and, and you don't agree with that. Well, that's good stuff to tell LPs. So that, <laughs> like, they'll give you money. That's for sure. So <laughs> and what you're saying is good stuff to tell founders because you need right. them to apply to YC. Exactly. So we <laughs> We're are all talking our book, Gary. That's how it works. But, um, <laughs> at the same time, like I, I genuinely believe like, and this is what's happened over the past 10 years. Like, you know, on the one hand, yes, like valuations are up. On the other hand, like I remember when I was uh, modeling my fund one of initialize a $7 million fund, we said, you know, best case, like, you know, this sounds crazy, but if we catch a drop box, that's like a $7 billion exit. And we were modeling like a five X return or something like that. Um, it turns out that we return more than 55 X DPI on that fund because of, uh, Coinbase and Instacart. Just, and so, just a quick salute there. Yeah, to Gary. thank you. Congrats. And, but I mean, basically even 10 years ago, we thought like, this is the craziest wild outcome. Like if we really knock it out of the park, it'll be a five X and we return 55 X. So I think that that's happening across all of venture and that's what we hope to continue to build that, um, the decacorns will be much more numerous. The hectocorns will become much more numerous. And then literally anyone, like, I think it's a macro shift. Like, this is what I believe is happening. And um, my main data is like working with the founders very directly, seeing that, you know, with the advent of large language models, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, the idea that like two or three people yeah. in a garage could literally get uh, ten to hundred thousand dollar a year contract and have that expand and like expand to millions of dollars you know that's happening over the course of like three to six months for a lot of companies in the AI world that like it's it's never been like that I've never seen that happen before and that's happening right now and that's more a testament to like literally computers have the the capability to reason and that's one of the most important things in the economy, period. But doesn't that mean that founders are going to need less money? They're going to be able to actually do more with less going back to like smaller fund sizes and things. They're going they're They just have more leverage. And in a world where price prices are coming down, like why? Why would I raise money? Yeah. I mean, inter I mean, the reality also is that uh, that macro shift is happening for founders. I mean, the average YC company, I think, is taking closer to. 10 or 12% dilution. Whereas like, you know, I think we did 750 K on uh, three post or something like that. Right. So, you know, it used to be the norm to take 20 to 40% dilution in the seed and another 20 to 40 in the series a, and you know, that's all good by my book. Like founders having more control means that, yeah. um, the outcomes can actually be a lot bigger. And so, uh, I think it's win, win, win across the board. And I think we're just getting started guys. Like, you know, the amount of incredible human capital that is wasted being a management consultant or an investment banker or even in legal in like all of these other knowledge work fields. It's like the same person given a different set of circumstances can literally create companies that Out drive hundreds to billions of dollars per year. Amen. And shouldn't we be doing that? Like we should be encouraging that. So a question I asked Mark Andreessen on Twitter was what's the limiting factor in the startup recipe? Is it capital? Is it enough talented founders? Is it talented or big ideas? I'm hearing you say it might be capital. We actually need more money flowing into this because the people are plenty. The ideas are out there. And we actually well, need more. Maybe it's smarter money. Smarter yeah. money. Is that right? I don't even think it's capital. I mean, there's a lot of capital. There in is. Startups, That's what so, oh, especially yeah. early stage. Um, I actually think it's community. Mm -hmm. I mean, it mm -hmm. is. Um, we need like a much like this is why I came back to Y Combinator. Like Y Combinator is the one place that allowed me to develop as a human get access to capital and then learn from other people and it took a village for me yeah. like i you know it's funny i went to a founders fund like one of their like really cool events recently and i looked around and i was like oh there's like a bunch of 22 year olds who have like everything that i had to learn i spent 20 years like making all the mistakes and like it's already yeah. in their brains and they're like you know working on Neuralink or like all kinds of crazy startup ideas I'm like, what did I miss? And it's like, oh no, that's great. Like yeah. community is happening. Um, you know, the belief is there. People are changing how they approach things. And uh, when, when they have a community that actually prepares them to do it, like way more of them will actually do it. 
And that's what I'm really excited about. It's, uh, I mean, we're, we just came off of zero interest rate phenomenon, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. like capital is definitely not the re limiting reagent. It's actually, um, and it's not people, right? It's actually people in community with the right values running at the right things. There's like infinite problems. <laughs> the problems are everywhere. <laughs> and like, hum you know, this is actually why I'm uh, an effective accelerationist at this point. Like I super deeply, I just deeply, deeply believe that, um, the rate of technological change can happen, uh, can, can actually increase from here. And um, ultimately, we have to believe that we can do it in order to actually get there. I love that. All right, we got a couple questions we ask people before we wrap up. Um, one is, who's the investor you admire most? Oh, man. Investor. And then I'll ask you operator, too. So there's going to be two there. I don't know. I mean, I feel like there are so many greats that <laughs> that's a hard one. It's like, um, shoot, there are too many people to like mention. And then honestly, I might offend someone if I like leave Who's them Who's one out. that you really like? Okay. I don't know. I mean, at the end of the day, like the way Mark has built, you know, sort of what he's done, it's, you know, he literally is sort of the, the best builder who sort of has turned around to build an organization. You're talking Mark Andreessen? Mark Andreessen, yeah. Okay. How about operator? One that you like. Doesn't have to be the best. But oh. A founder that you just admire or an operator. I mean, honestly, Parker Conrad is on his yeah. own level Good with choice. Rippling. Like, yeah. I just can't really. Well, uh, yeah, I think he might be my I choice. I think the, he's a little, he's incredible. And then I think the fact that he, he came back to YC is an interesting part of the Rippling oh, story. Oh, yeah, Sterling wanted to ask that, by the way. Uh, yeah, I mean... Why, why does someone like Parker, who already had so much knowledge from, you know, a Zenefits run, come back and, and he knew what he was building and he knew how he was going to build it. So why do people like that come back to YC? Well, I mean, one of the memes that I'd love to get out there, which I think is actually quite true, is um, coming back is like sort of like coming home. Mm. Um, so that's like sort of what, you know, my personal answer, but at the same time, like I think rippling is incredibly important for people to be able to sell to other companies yeah. and, um, being a YC company is Allows often, that. you know, basically worth its weight in gold just yeah. off of that. Okay. La last one for me is, uh, I call it the golden spur question. What, what drives you? Why are you the way that you are? You talked about your childhood kind of rough, but why are you this way? Uh, I often ask that myself. <laughs> my wife asks do, me of this all the, the time. What do the therapists say? Yeah, here? yeah. <laughs> my wife sometimes is like, "Why are you like this, Gary?" <laughs> <laughs> Mine too. Funny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, hmm, what's a good answer for that? Um, I guess I'm just a joiner. At the end of the day, um, you know, I get excited by ideas. Um, I all along like myself I you know I always believed and maybe this is actually something that um, I have to thank my father for um, you know he is a man of many faults but one thing that he always emphasized for me was like Gary you're set you're set apart like I would come home with a, a B plus and he'd be like Gary what, what is this and I'm like what like my friends got a B plus and it's like oh are you the same as your friends like are you you know there or are you a cut above and he always um, I mean, through many different ways, made it clear, like my, the expectations on me were far above that of anyone else's. So, um, I guess, I guess I really, uh, it's, it's, there's something about startups that really speak out to me. It's like when I meet with founders, I genuinely want them to be the cut above. And it's like, that's sort of one of the conversations I feel like I have with people all the time that like, I just want the outcome to be so great. And to do that, it requires a belief. And so um, I want to breathe that type of belief into others. And then this is basically the best job in the world to do that. We really appreciate you taking the time. This was an awesome conversation. Yeah, thanks, thanks Gary. Gary. It was awesome. Yeah, we'll do it again. Thank you Absolutely. guys for having me. Thank you. All right, so let's recap, Sterling. Um, 
we have a couple per people who listen to this podcast. You got investors, operators, founders. Which one's this going to be most relevant for? Well, what's crazy about Gary is he's actually been a founder. He's gone through an accelerator as a founder. He's gone through an exit as a founder. Um, and then he's also the CEO of Y Combinator and um, had, I, I think, a $3 billion AUM at Initialized. So he's, he's done he's it both. all. Yep, he's both. Yeah. And he I, told us, he talked about in the podcast how you can't say both. You can't pick both, but I'm going with both. Yeah, I think he's both too. All right. What are our top takeaways for for this one? What do you think? Some things that stuck out to me were his learnings around co-founder dynamics. Love that. How important it is to be able to argue with people, disagree with people, and then but not fracture the relationship. Yeah, funny. He said, I took the advice of you have to have a good relationship with your co-founder. And I'm like, actually, you do. But good means fight. So I think he just misunderstood that advice rather than didn't live it. And maybe fight is the wrong word too. Disagree the right way. You got to debate and argue and and be able to do so in highly emotional ways and then not let it fracture the underlying relationship. And the thing that's interesting to me there, he talks about, okay, you got to narrow your focus. You got to search for that desperation specifically and then broaden where if you find it initially, I think you can go broad a lot faster. And so they're, they're in, they're in competition a little bit, but he, he definitely thinks there's more people who want to build something. They just aren't exactly sure what that is yet versus people who have the inside and are just ready to go. Yep. He talked about, um, I'm a little bit of like the sell ahead, but how did he say it? Like you have to de-risk it somehow. I was, uh, I can't remember it, but he did seem to say that the way, oh, liars are buyers is what I'm thinking of. He, he validated buyers that liars, a lot yeah. or buyers are liars. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, and and that we want to be lied to. And so there's a a gem in there for founders about be very skeptical when people are telling you things you want to hear, but they are not taking the actions Actions. that you want them to take or the actions that uh, are are congruent with with what they're saying. So the advice around uh, like buyers or liars around uh, edge of the wedge, what else was there for early stage founders? Authenticity, lean into your corners. Don't try and round them out. I, this one, this one hits home for me because I think whenever you're trying to be a leader of people, your people try to water you down, right? You're supposed to appeal to, to more folks and, and that's, that's kind of been common wisdom, but you're not trying to appeal to everybody as a startup leader. You're trying to appeal to an absolute fringe within a fringe. Which and that's where your power into comes his cult from. metaphor as yeah. well, which he leaned into. It's like, yeah, you're actually trying to build a religion, which is only possible if the founder of the religion has some weird edges around Absolutely. Him. I mean, and, and look at these successful companies. Palantir is absolutely a religion. What, what Gary does with the community of YC is absolutely a religion. And the great startups always are, and it's the religion of the, it's the, religion of the founders. What other takeaways? Any others we got to hit? Oh, man. I, I thought it was fascinating... Um, to hear him talk about rage quitting and decision making and some of those kinds of things and how, how to evaluate opportunities, just very cool. Cause he's had basically, um, unlimited, amazing opportunities. So I just thought that was interesting. Agree. I think my last one here is it seems clear to me that Gary's doing what God put him on the earth to do. Like Mm -hmm. he's doing what Gary Tan is meant to do. He talked about community and he's got this special place for YC and feels very lucky for the world and for the organization that he's doing that. And he was pretty, you know, passionate about that. You could tell. 